folks. Welcome to my house. That's what that says in Gaelic. This large tool here is called the two-man crosscut saw. And it was used to forge our way through the Americas when settlers first came. Other tools such as the axes have also been used to shape America into what it is today. At my house, I've collected tools for years and years and years. And a lot of times, some of these tools have been used by my ancestors or given to me by friends who may have had ancestors that used them. And sometimes they've been given to me by folks that just go around to different yard sales and find these unique tools and know that I am a lover of all of these cool tools. So today, I'm gonna to be talking about some of these tools and explaining their uses. So the two man cross cut saw is a very long saw, approximately five feet. And you'll notice that it has a curvature in it. Let me go down here like this. See how it's got a curve in it like that? Well, when you're pulling back and forth on this thing, you don't push it, you only pull it. So a man will be over here pulling and a man will be over here pulling and they alternate back and forth and back and forth. Because of this curvature, it gives bite better on the, on the tree when we're trying to saw it. Look at these aggressive teeth too. These things are massive. All right, there's my finger. I can fit it into that gullet there. These teeth here are the cutters. You'll notice that this one is sharpened in one direction and this one is sharpened in the other direction. The cleaner is sharpened straight on so that it just drags out the waste. You'll notice that these handles just screw off so that this can be put into a vise and sharpened without the blade, without the handles that getting in the way of the saw blade. There, now it's very tight on the saw and that way we can pull on it to get our cuts. Planes have their own little space in woodworking from the very old ones here this is what is called a jointer, all right? It's, it is only partially good, the, the handle's out of it. It was found at a yard sale by one of my friends and, and given to me. The blade is held in place by this piece of wood that's shaped. And there you have your blade. So this is probably homemade but it done the job. In the old days, the Appalachian people had to do what they needed to survive in this world. So a lot of times their tools were made. When we go on up in the world into modern day, then we have you know, newer pieces of equipment still put onto a block, to a wooden block. And then we have a fully forged plane here. Shapers also were used to create different types of moldings. And again, this would have been homemade. And the blade, again, is held in place by a piece of wood. This is known as a brace and bit. This is the brace, and obviously this is the bit. Notice that it has a funky-looking tail on it. This is called a tang, T-A-N-G, and it is used to help hold it in to the brace. In a modern day drill bit, we just have a shank that might be a hexagon in, in, in shape so that the, the chuck of the drill 
will hold that much better. But in the old days, this tang actually helped hold this in place of the brace. These are push drills, or sometimes referred to as a Yankee screwdriver. Basically, they can be used to push down. See how that, how that turns when I push down? Gotta be real careful that I don't drill through. This drill bit is quite unique as it's not like a twist bit that we may have in our toolbox. But this is just a straight on cut double fluted push drill bit. Different companies made them, but they're hard to find these days. Back before the new age manufactured levels, we had these type of levels made out of wood where you had, this was used for plumbing. No, not plumbing like pipes, but plumb. So that when we try to put up against the wall, we try to get it plumb or we try to get it level. Sometimes craftsmen would only have a stick called a plumb stick or, and a level stick. So they may not have both, but be specialized just to have one. This is a hand drill. And you would put your shoulder into this, hold on to it with one hand this way. And then as you crank that, see how that turns? That is a hand drill. This also has a chuck on it, and the size of the chuck determines the size of the shank on the bit that it would accept. This little number here is a sanding block. Doesn't look like no sander that we've used much, but basically you take your sandpaper and you wrap it around here, and then you can grab onto this and use that to sand with. It'd be a lot of hard work considering we have a lot of electrical tools today to do the same thing. Now let's talk about bits a bit. So drill bits come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and lengths. And for the purpose that you need it for, you might need a specific bit. And let's talk about these. The auger bit. So this is a auger bit and the auger, the auger is that little screw on the end of it that pulls it into the wood. This is a double cut, single spiral auger bit. This is a double cut, double spiral auger bit. And you can see that this one has half as many twists on it as this one and this one. Also notice this little edge on there. So those little edges, as they go around, they cut the fibers of the wood so that you get a cleaner hole and it don't just peel up and look terrible. You can get these in a tang or you can get them in a shank that will work in a modern day drill. These larger augers here are meant to get into larger timbers. And just like its little cousin, you have a double cut, double twist, and you have a single cut, single twist. And you can kind of see how those two look like in relationship to each other. Notice that they don't have that little side tang on there like these had. And what I'm talking about is this little piece right here, a little blade on the end of it. These are not used for finish work. These are for getting holes through large timbers so that we can run wire or plumbing or any number of things. And they come in a variety of sizes from the very small to the very large, and they even make them much larger than this. 
the modern day auger, which you can readily get at any home uh, improvement store, has the little auger on the end of it that pulls it into the wood stock, but then it has a different type of cutter. So this is a tri-twist, has three twists on it. It does have a little tang on the end of it there so that you can cut the wood and it won't uh, splinter it quite so bad. But again, these are not made for finish work. This is for getting it into the wood and getting the job done. The more familiar twist bit or high speed bit as it's sometimes called is a double twist. And if you'll notice that it is a, has a conical point here but it also, if you look really closely at the, at the way that the tooth is sharpened, it, it goes back just a little bit so that this part hits the wood and this does not. And it, way it, it shaves a bit of that wood off so that it can continue to go on in. Again, they can be bought in a variety of sizes from the very small to the very large. You can also get them with a smooth shank, or you can also get them in a shank that will work in a driver. So this, you don't have to have a special drill at hand. You can just have one driver and it will go in the end of it. And then you can pull this out and put a driver in and have only one tool. Another common modern day drill bit is the spade bit, which just is a flat piece of steel that's sharpened in a conical point with two little wings on the end of it so that it digs out the wood fibers. Some of them have the little side tangs on them and some of them don't. And they come in again, a variety of sizes. This is what's known as a Forstner bit. When we use this bit, it makes a clean cut on the sides and it makes a flat, fairly flat bottom on the hole. Whereas in this one, of course, it would have the auger hole at the bottom. And this one would have a conical point on the bottom. These are used for finish work, even though they can get very aggressive looking. Again, these can be bought in an auger or they can be bought in just a flat bottom Forstner type bit. Sometimes you need a very large hole and we have to use what is known as a hole saw. So this is a drill bit that has teeth on it like a saw and you can get them in very small shapes or you can get them in very large shapes. When you're using the larger shapes, you wanna use a shank that has these two little ears on there and they go in these holes here and here. You can also get larger ones that will use these larger holes. You don't wanna use the larger ones with just a regular hand drill. You wanna be able to use the larger ones with an angle drill so you have better leverage. Otherwise, it's gonna twist your arm clean off. These things can be pretty mean. The smaller ones don't have those little tangs on them. They just screw into the end. And then we can saw through our wood. Notice that they do have a starter hole or a starter drill that will allow us to find center before we get into the drill portion of it. Sometimes you gotta drill through masonry and these are masonry bits. In the old days, we would use this type of bit. This is a masonry bit. Even though it's used much like a chisel, we hit it with a hammer. So basically you hit it with a hammer, 
you turn it, you hit it with a hammer, you turn it, you hit it with a hammer, and continue on through the masonry until it's all the way through. Obviously, it's not gonna give you a very clean or nice hole. We came up through evolution, and we have this type of twist-type bit that is used for masonry. It has a tungsten carbide tip on the end of it so that it will stay sharper longer as it's going through masonry. These little flutes down here just pull the masonry material out of the way. And those can be bought in very small, very large, and very long. Modern day bits also have that tungsten carbide bit tip on the end of it, but they can be bought in a smooth shank or they can be bought in a locking shank such as this. This will only go into a rotary hammer. The rotary hammer not only turns it, but it also gives it kind of a motion beating on the end of it. Where did you see that before? Remember this one? Hit, turn, hit, turn, hit, turn. Well, these rotary bits do the same thing, but very, very fast. As I told you, you can get these in very long lengths, but sometimes it's still not long enough. So you can get an extension. These extensions can go together and make them extremely long. At one time, I had a drill bit with enough extensions on it that it would cut through a post eight foot long. Why would I need something so long? To do my wiring. As you can see in this post here, I have a outlet in the middle of the post. And then if I come around here, I've got a switch. So actually, power comes up through the basement into this post, gets the outlet on the back side. I have my light switch here, and then it runs up and connects to this light here. So there's actually a hole all the way through this entire post. In order to drill that, I had to have all the extensions. Sometimes, if you look at this post here, See how it kind of kilters? It twists just a little bit. Let me get in here a little closer and you can kind of see how it twisted. Well, this is, this, this, the grain in this wood was not the best in the world. It went all over the place. And as I was drilling, I popped out, it came out. So sometimes accidents happen when we're trying to drill those. The plane is a chisel with a flat end on it. The chisel being here so that it shaves off pits and pieces of the wood and allows it not to grow any deeper. Let's say that I need to make this smooth across the top. I've cut it with a saw and it has a couple of saw marks in it in a curvature because I've used a circular blade. Now, I could use a chisel such as this to try to make it smooth. But if I do that, you'll see how it just digs in and goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. What if we take a chisel and put it on something flat? So here we have a plane that has a chisel, very large chisel in there, but it's on a flat surface so that it keeps it from going any deeper in the wood. So as I go across through this, you'll see that the shaving is almost perfectly the same thickness all the way through. That way I can use this and I can continue on so that I get a nice edge on it. This takes lots of practice so that you get it square to the side. And you'll use a tri-square to check that squareness. Once I go over this a couple of times, 
I need to take my tri-square and put it on here and check the squareness here to make sure that I'm not kiltered in one way or the other. And I wanna check that throughout the entire length of my board to make sure that I'm getting it nice and square. I use my bench vise to keep shorter boards on here so that I can plane them. But what if I have a long board? Now I've got a long board. And if I try to put it in my vise and I get to working on this thing, it's gonna push down. I don't have a good way to support it. So what I do is I take this peg and I put it in a hole. I put it in this hole here that I have on the side of my bench. And then that way I can rest one piece of the wood on the peg. I can hold my piece of wood with the bench vise. Then I can go to work all the way down. The plane has a lot of intricate parts on it. It has a cam and a frog that holds it, the blade in place. We have a chipper and that's that, the chipper has this little piece here that pulls the wood up and away from the blade. And then of course you've got the blade itself. The chipper also supports and stabilizes the blade so it doesn't fluctuate any at all. And it's held in place by a screw in the middle of it that it can be slid back and forth depending on how deep you want to get your blade. Notice that the chipper is back off the blade just slightly and that is basically the maximum thickness that you would ever want to cut with this plane. Other parts are the lateral adjustment and the depth adjustment. The depth adjustment runs this little arm right here up and down so that th this slides up and down in the cradle. This allows the blade to be adjusted back and forth this way so that the blade end is parallel with the bottom or base of the plane. When we want to adjust the blade, the lateral blade on it, then we have to look at the end of it. You'll notice that on this side, it's a little bit prouder than it is on the other side. Proud, that's a term you need to learn. See how it's not exactly perfect? We can use this lateral adjustment here By looking down the plane, we can get that as straight as possible. Just like that. When we're using the plane, it would be nice if our grain was all nice and straight. So that when we plane this back and forth, we're gonna be taking off very nice shavings and we're not gonna have a problem with it. Well, wood is not always that forgivable. Notice how the grain runs downward here, and then it does this kind of wavy effect across through here. So as I was cutting, as I was cutting this with the table saw, you'll see how rough it is, and then it becomes smooth and then it becomes rough again, and then it becomes smooth, and then it becomes rough again. The reason for that is when I was cutting it, I was going against the grain. So when I say against the grain, what I mean was I was cutting it, I was cutting it in that direction. 
So as I was going across through here, this grain here was in this direction and it was breaking off rather than being cut very nicely. Over here, where we had a very nice smooth cut on it, the grain is running in this direction. And then as we are cutting across it, it feathers it. All right, that's another term, feathering. So it feathers it off and cuts it very nice and smooth. And we get a much better look. Now this, remember that this is a saw than we did over here where it got really rough. See how the fibers just break off, whether they're cut over here. So when I plane this, if I'm planing over this, I'm feathering it down and I'm getting a very nice smooth edge out of it. Whereas over here, I'm going in the opposite direction and I'm breaking those fibers off. You can see how messy it looks. So when you plane, always plane to feather the edges. In other words, go in that direction. Don't be going in this direction. Another type of chisel or plane would be the draw knife. And the draw knife is very useful in taking off corners and making them round. But again, it's not for finish work. This is for taking off a whole lot of stock really quickly just to make it round or just to get rid of some bark or something of that matter. The draw knife. This is a bow saw. And the bow saw in this particular case is made of wood. It's an older saw that was used uh, 100 years ago, probably even more. And it has this, this very weak uh, wooden frame on it that's held together with two cleats here. And then we can, we can tighten this up. Make sure I'm going in the right direction. We can tighten this up and get our blade very nice and tight. Once I do this, you'll notice it doesn't rack. This is a single man saw. And makes quick work out of cutting wood. Much like its older cousin here, a new bow saw is made of metal and it has a much different blade on it. This has cutters on it, and they go back and forth to give you a kerf, and then it has that cleaner on it, much like the two-man crosscut saw. To get the blade on and off this one, you have this little lever on the back that you would open up, then that way you can change out the blade, pop this back into place, and it will do a very good job at cutting lumber. Saws come in a variety of different shapes and sizes and purposes. When we first started working with saws, we didn't have the metal technology to keep a, a saw straight when we were pushing it. And it would tend to bend and be floppy. So we had a pull saw. This is a pull saw. Notice that the teeth go back towards the handle. So this cuts in the pull. You can kind of hear how it gets loud when I pull back. It's not so loud when I pull forward when I push it forward. So that means that it cuts in the pull, not on the push. Another way that we could have improved on our saws is putting a back on it. And this is considered a back saw. It has a hard, large back piece on the end of the saw, which makes it very sturdy so that we can cut it in the push rather than the pull. As technology advanced in 
metallurgy, we were able to make saws that you could push. These are very thin. They still will bend a little bit. But when we go to saw with it, it doesn't bend. The teeth of the saw are made in such a way that they can be used in different ways. For instance, when we cut through a piece of wood and we're cutting through it this way, we're cutting cross grain. The grain is running in back and forth and we're cutting through the grain in this fashion here. These type of blades or teeth are made very much like a knife. You can see these teeth are set back and forth and meaning that some of them are leaned over this way, some of them are leaned over this way, and that gives us a kerf. To sharpen these, I'm going to sharpen one edge of the blade in this direction and another edge of the blade in this direction so that I end up with a point very much like my knife. So that when I cut through this, it is cutting through the fibers. Just like the crosscut saw, the rip saw has teeth that are back and forth that give us this kerf. These blades are designed to cut with the grain and we call those rip saws. So we're ripping the wood across the grain whereas we were cross cutting before. Another similarity but difference out of the rip saw is that it's more like a chisel than a knife. So even though these teeth are set back and forth in this manner, they are sharpened straight on just like the chisel. We sharpen these blades straight back and forth, just exactly like the chisel. When this goes through the wood, it actually rips through and peels out the, the grain so that we can cut through it much easier. If we compare the cross-cut saw to the rip saw, you can get an idea of how the teeth are done. This is more like a chisel. This is more like a knife. These are smaller. These are larger. We compare the two blades in another fashion where we're looking straight down on them, this being the cross-cut, this being the rip saw. You can kind of get an idea of how this is sharpened like a knife and this is sharpened like a chisel. Other type of saws that we have is known as a keyhole saw. So it's a very small tip on it to a larger size. And it can be used to make slight curves. But the real one to use when you're doing curves is a coping saw. This blade is extremely small and thin. It also can be turned so that when you're cutting through a piece of wood, you can actually do a circle all the way around and be able to keep the, the back out of the way from your work. This is a flush cut saw. So the saw is offset in such a manner so that you can put it right down on the surface and you can cut through something and it will be even with the surface itself. This little knob here allows this to turn around so that you can cut in this direction as well as that direction. It's also noteworthy to mention that since our wooden saws are made of wood and wood is dynamic, meaning that it can move over time, we want to release our tension on here so that when we hang it up for storage, it doesn't move. Axes come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. From a failing axe or a boy's axe, which has a point on it and is
is sloped on both sides so that you can split wood very easily. To the double bladed axe, again, it's shaped like the failing axe in a wedge shape so that it splits wood as well as takes out chips when we're cutting down trees. Hatchets, like I've discussed before, also have that wedge shape, but a much shorter handle. This one also has a little notch in there to pull nails with. This is an Appalachian broad axe, and this is what helped build America what it is today. On one side, it has a very nice wide blade on it so that we could take chips out and square up logs and make them a balk. It has a hammer side on it so that we could drive pegs and so forth. But if you'll notice, if you look very carefully, this side here is kind of curved. And it's maybe kind of hard for me to show you that. So it's curved a bit, but then the handle is also curved. Notice how the handle curves. And that way that when I'm using this, my fingers are out of the way and I'm not gonna end up taking my knuckles off. Appalachian broad axe. This is a Swedish broad axe. It still has a nice wide head on it, but instead of the handle being curved, notice how the blade curves. So it's got a slight, it's got a slight angle on it. So that it also has a shorter handle so that it can be used with one hand to do the work. This is a broad axe, but in a boy axe form. It has a shorter handle on it. Notice that the handle is curved slightly, and we have a flat side on it. That way we can use it to trim up our wood without it digging into it. The same type of broad axe with an offset flat edge on it allows us to trim our pieces of wood to make very nice square edges. This particular tool here was made by my grandfather. Notice that it has a pivot point on it where it might have been bolted down to something. And then on this side here, it had a tang that accept a wooden handle. This was used to trim shingles and shakes for roofing. Various Appalachian cultures used everything that they possibly could to make a tool that would be useful for them. This tool was used to dig two rows of planting. This was a hand cultivator. This is a brace and bit made for drilling holes in a corner. How many of you can guess what this tool is used for? Any guesses? Believe it or not, it's the first vacuum. Well, kinda. In the old days, we used to take our rugs and we would hang them on a line and we would take a carpet beater and beat the soil out of the carpet. This is a carpet beater.